running to and fro across the land. It's the glorious sound of freedom I hear. The prairies and mountains are haunts of this band. I'm hunting the white-tailed deer. I've seen them in the high plains, I've seen them on the prairie, I've searched them both far and near. And I'm gonna keep on trying to get the one I want, I'm hunting the white-tailed deer. Running to and fro across the land, it's the glorious sound of freedom I hear. The prairie and mountains are haunts of this band. I'm hunting the white-tailed deer. They're wily, they're cagey, and darn hard. Hi, I'm Jay Warburton, and it is my pleasure as host of the Sportsman's Workshop series to bring you this program on how to hunt white-tailed deer. In many states, the white-tailed deer is the only big game animal available to legally hunt. However, this does not diminish the white-tail's reputation among sportsmen as one of the most challenging big game animals in not only North America, but in the world to hunt. As many as 50 million deer inhabited the North American continent when the Europeans first began to realize the abundance of the New World resources. Throughout the 19th century, commercial opportunists were responsible for the slaughter and near extinction of not only buffalo, but the white-tailed deer as well. Literally tons of hides and venison left the seaports of this country bound for the markets of England and Europe. By the early 20th century, whitetail numbers had fallen to less than 500,000 within the boundaries of the U.S. The whitetail population had become so few and far between that exploiters found it no longer profitable. Today, the white-tailed deer population has grown so greatly that practically every state and province in North America has a hunting season. For this formidable adversary, this has been brought about not only through the animal's own intelligence and unique ability to adapt, but more importantly, through the continued efforts of concerned sportsmen and game management techniques. These efforts have not only preserved the animal, but are responsible for building herds capable of providing an exciting challenge for today's sportsmen. With the purchase of individual state deer hunting licenses, every citizen, as well as sportsman, can have the opportunity to enjoy the abundance of white-tailed deer. My friend and colleague, John Wooters, a professional outdoorsman and author, will now share with us his knowledge and experience of over 30 years in hunting white-tailed deer. White-tails are found in an amazing variety of habitats. Almost anywhere on the continent, from northern Canada to Central America, we find them in mountains as high as 10,000 feet. We find them in tropical jungles. We find them in on deserts, or what most people would consider deserts, swamps. They live in the, the woodlot behind the farmer's barn, where they see men and smell them and hear them every day. Uh, this is the secret of the success of the whitetail. And if you're not prepared to be adaptable yourself, you may have difficulty finding the animals. Wherever whitetails are found, in whatever sort of habitat, they will always be found along what we call habitat edges, which can be described as a place where two types of habitat meet. An example would be an open field or meadow and a heavy forest, where the two different kinds of terrain come together always be a concentration point for whitetails. This is critically important to successful hunting. Yeah. Looking for a place to hunt a buck, we're scouting for basically five things. We're looking for browse marks where they've been feeding, tracks, droppings, buck rubs, and buck scrapes. All these are important. Well, here's a, a rub which is important to us because it is sign made only by a buck. It is not just deer sign, it's buck sign specifically. The things you'll notice about a fresh rub are the tattered bark where he has torn them free with his antlers. You may also find uh, branches that he's actually torn completely off of the tree. You want to look for area here where his hooves were driving in the brush as he rubbed his antlers strongly against the tree. Earlier in the season when he takes the velvet off his antlers, he'll make a rub like this, but it will not be nearly this destructive or this large. 
One thing that's important about a rub is the uh, age of it. You want to be able to judge that, uh, and it will vary in different parts of the country according to humidity and weather and whether this rub is in the sun or in the shade. This one being in the sun, it will dry out pretty quickly, and by tomorrow it will look uh, much older than one that was made at the same time in the shade. Uh, one pretty good trick for judging the age of a rub is to take the back of your hunting knife and rub a little bark off and compare the color of your rub to that made by the deer. Uh, if the color is quite similar, the rub will be quite fresh. This one apparently was made last night. White-tailed deer eat an amazing variety of foods, but in each particular area they have their own favorites. It's important that a hunter learn what to eat in his part of the world and know where that type of food is available. Uh, when you find browse marks like these, you'll note that because a whitetail has no teeth in the front of his upper jaw, anything that he bites off, whether it's leaves or buds, tend to look like they were pinched off with a thumbnail. That's a sure sign that it was a deer that did it. Obviously, if you know where a deer is feeding, it's a pretty good place to hunt. Now here's a rub on a much bigger tree than that uh, red willow a moment ago. This one is uh, almost surely made by a mature buck. Now one of the striking characteristics about this rub is that while his antlers were rubbing on the main trunk here, some of the tips of his fighting tines were scratching the secondary trunk over here. And at times, you can actually use that uh, measurement to judge the size of the animal's antlers. In any case, this is evidently a rub made by a substantial buck and an animal well worth hunting. A scrape like this one is the most exciting deer sign that a hunter can find because it means that this is the center of a buck's breeding territory and he will come back to this place. Scrapes are always found on trails, along trails, and usually in the edge of a clearing. A scrape is a mark made in the ground by a, a buck. He paws the dirt away with his front feet. And it will also always be found under an overhanging twig or branch, which he will have chewed, nibbled on, and battered with his antlers. The current thinking is that the overhanging twig is the mark of ownership and that the uh, scent marking that's placed on that twig tells all the deer in the area which buck made the scrape. There are several different kinds of scrapes, but the ones that are made for breeding purposes will usually be in the center of an area in which there are a number of other scrapes around, many of which will not appear to be active. The active scrape will usually have some muddy spot in it where the buck has urinated, usually have his tracks in it too, as this one does. The uh, dirt will all be thrown in the same direction, and it's sometimes possible to tell in which direction the buck was traveling when he stopped to make a scrape. In any case, the value of a scrape is the fact that a whitetail buck will come back to this, having made, having opened and anointed his scrape, he will come back to it several times every day for the person that wants a buck, and not just any doe, this is the most encouraging sign you can find anywhere in the woods. It's well worth spending some time looking for scrapes. Still hunting is uh, often thought to be hunting in a stationary position, but really, still hunting means to move quietly through the woods, where stand hunting is sitting in one place and waiting for the deer to come to you. What you try to do when still hunting is to become a part of the woods as much as possible. You move very slowly, you move only a few steps at a time, and each place that you have a new vista, you open it up, stop, and perhaps spend 10 or 15 minutes there. You, uh, in effect, are stalking the cover. Of course, if there's a little bit of wind blowing, it helps to cover your own movements, but naturally you try to be as quiet as possible. You like to hunt across the wind or upwind so that the deer can't smell you coming. And I prefer to have the sun behind me as I have now. This helps immensely in trying to 
see a motionless deer in heavy brush. When you do have to cross an opening on a still hunt, it's a good idea to take a lesson from the deer. Don't cross it, go around through the edge of it. If you do have to cross an open area, do it smoothly and as quickly as possible. And when you stop in, in a still hunt, it's a good idea always to choose a place where you have some cover, where your outline is broken up by brush behind you or brush in front of you, where you can see out and the deer can't see into the brush. Stand hunting is by far the most productive method of hunting whitetail simply because the hunter is being motionless and the deer is in motion, which makes it much easier for the hunter to remain unseen. Also, uh, a well-chosen stand location can place the hunter in a position where he is reasonably sure that a, uh, a deer or a buck will, will be coming, either because it overlooks a well-known trail, a, uh, a feeding area, or a bedding ground, or perhaps a scrape during the rut. The important thing is to get where you can see the area you expect to see the deer in, to get where you have no obstruction to your shot, where your bullet doesn't have to go through too much brush, and preferably not too much twigs around you that could catch on your clothes as you raise a rifle, because usually with a stand, your buck will be close and you won't have very much time the time you begin to raise the rifle until you get the shot off. This kind of stand, just a seat against a tree, is the simplest, but there are many other kinds of stands uh, in an area where there was not enough concealment or with a hunter who feels he might not be able to sit still enough long enough, we can use brush to build a brush blind or a commercially manufactured uh, ground blind or a stand up a tree. The advantage of a tree stand, of course, is that it gets your scent above the heads of the deer and they can't smell you nearly as well if they're downwind from you as they can in a stand like this. For the hunter that knows how to use them, these are the deadliest weapons he has, no matter what state he hunts in. The sound that is made is not only banging the antlers together, which I'll demonstrate in a moment, but also when two bucks fight, they also demonstrate to each other their ferocity by savaging small bushes and plants nearby. And so normally one starts a sequence of horn rattling by imitating that sound like this. Very often that's all you need to do. The buck will sometimes appear on the strength of that. Uh, another part of the horn rattling process is the imitation of the sound of hooves on the ground. Which you can make like that. The main part is the clash of the antlers. It lasts about 15 to 40 seconds, 15 to 30 or 40 seconds. And it must be borne in mind that a battle between two whitetail bucks is more a pushing contest than a, than a duel, a fencing duel. And the sound goes very much like this. It is always ended by that wrenching a part of the antlers. That seems to be important. The initial clash is not so important and frequently on the second sequence in the same place. I omit that. Put the horns together quietly and rattle more quietly. I do that on the assumption that the first clash has brought a deer in close that I haven't seen. And he is hanging out. And just tickling the horns together will often pull him out of the woods. The critical thing about horn rattling is that it be done preferably near an active scrape and the sound of other bucks or what he thinks is the sound of other bucks fighting in that vicinity tends to enrage him. Another thing about rattled bucks is that they tend to be so convinced that they're going to find two deer fighting that they will stand still for all kinds of shenanigans 
such as a sight of you moving, reaching to pick your rifle up. Uh, my wife and I were rattling one time and her scope fogged when a buck came in and the buck stood there and watched us trade rifles and uh, never moved a muscle until a bullet hit him. You know, a telescopic sight like this one is by far the finest deer hunting sight ever made for a number of reasons. Actually, the magnification is the least important of the reasons to use a telescope. The uh, scope is not only the fastest sight for moving shots, it has two other great advantages. One of them is that it gathers light, gathers more light than your unaided eye can. And particularly very early in the morning, very late in the evening, just when the deer tend to move the best, uh, you can see to shoot with a scope when you could not with any other kind of sights. Another great value of it is essentially a safety measure in that it helps you be certain what you're shooting at. Uh, if you see an unidentified lump in the brush that might be a deer, and raise the rifle on it. If it isn't a deer, you can tell it instantly with a scope. A scope is not an instrument for observation. It's an instrument for shooting. It's not really a very good telescope, or however good a sight it may be. For that reason, I always carry a pair of very lightweight, compact binoculars of this sort. And any time I am deliberately glassing an area for game, I use them instead of my rifle scope. This keeps me from ever finding myself with a, a loaded, high-powered rifle pointed at another human being, even by accident. You need to familiarize yourself with the anatomy of the animal at which you'll be shooting. The main thing to remember is that your bullet is being directed to internal organs. You want to, to remember that you're shooting at the heart-lung area the easiest way to be sure of doing that and not spoil too much meat is to come right up the leg, the vertical crosshair, come about halfway up the uh, body between the uh, withers and brisket and put your shot right in there. That gives you the greatest latitude for error around the point of aim. Another way to think of it is this. You're shooting at perhaps you can think of it as a 10 inch diameter balloon inflated inside the animal's body and shoot at the center of that balloon from any angle, from the front or quartering from the rear, broadside. The main thing is you don't shoot at the shoulder, you shoot at the heart lungs, which lie inside. I've seen them in the high plains, I've seen them on the prairie, I've searched them both far and near. If you're going to use a shotgun for, for deer, and in many states it's mandatory by law, it's uh, important to have, uh, have sights on the shotgun. The use of uh, rifle slugs, which is the ammunition of choice for most hunters, uh, in an unsighted shotgun is generally unsatisfactory with any gun, rifle or shotgun. It's important to be familiar with the location of the safety. With a bolt-action rifle, safety can be located at the rear on the tang, as it is in this case, or it may be a sliding safety located right here, and in a few it may be located on the shroud of the bolt here. Wherever it is, the first thing that should be done with any new gun is to familiarize oneself with the location of the safety as well as the mechanical aspects of the rifle. Many hunters sight their rifles in by taking one shot with their elbows leaned over the hood of a pickup truck at a beer can at some unidentified distance. And if they come within a foot of it, they say, well, that ought to be good enough and go hunting. That is not the way to do it. Uh, the trick is not to determine how well you can shoot, but to determine how well the gun and scope and ammunition shoot. And to do that, you have to fire the gun from a solid rest, like these sandbags, at a clearly defined target, one that you can see well with the sights that you're going to be using. With any modern cartridge, the proper way to sight a rifle in is so that the group forms about three inches above the center of the bullseye at 100 yards. 
if the bullet never rises above nor falls below the line of sight out to about 225 yards or so, you don't have to worry about distance within any reasonable hunting range. You simply hold the crosshairs in the middle of the animal's chest and pull the trigger without even attempting to estimate range. Another thing that's very important in sighting in is that you must use the exact same ammunition with which you'll hunt. The reason for that is that even the same bullet weight from different manufacturers will shoot to a different point of impact with, in a given rifle. So if, whether you hand load or use factory ammunition, it's critical always to use exactly the same ammunition. Not just the same brand or the same bullet weight, but everything must be the same. It's a good idea to buy enough before the season to do your sighting in and your hunting with at the same time so you have it out of the same lot. A smart shooter never fires a rifle or any sort of gun under any circumstances without protecting his eyes and his ears. Even one shot from a high-powered rifle can do permanent damage to your hearing. There's so many different uh, cartridges and so many calibers, most of which will do the job, that I'm reluctant to recommend any one or any class. But I do think it's uh, important that hunters consider using a cartridge that has at least enough power to be certain of a, a humane kill, a clean kill on the white-tailed deer. Uh, in my opinion, this would be roughly a cartridge driving a bullet of about 125 grains at the minimum at a velocity of at least 2,900 or perhaps 3,000 feet per second. Anything over that will do a good job if the hunter does his part. There's an old saying that if uh, the the last man on earth will have a white-tailed deer and cockroach and a coyote for, for company. And I think that's probably true. They'll be the last to go. I have to agree with my friend John Wooters. Of all the big game animals in the world, the whitetail is the most challenging. You must have knowledge and patience. If you use what you have learned from this program, you will increase your chances for a successful hunt. I'm convinced that some deer after they have survived four or five hunting seasons, literally become unkillable by legal means. I don't think that you can, uh, if you obey the law, uh, take those deer. I remember one that I was involved with for about four years. The funny thing about him was that he was he lived in an area where he could be seen pretty easily from, from a distance. And uh, I could take people up there and show them the deer. Uh, with a spotting scope or with a pair of binoculars. And I and four or five of the best hunters I know tried everything we could think of. We tried to rattle him out of that draw he lived in. We tried to, uh, we made quiet drives. We made noisy drives. We tried to sneak in there before daylight and uh, uh, position ourselves on his escape routes and then have somebody walk up the draw from below. Uh, we tried to set up stands. Uh, we invested in expensive long-range rifles. And as far as I know, he's still there. That, uh, that deer simply defeated every effort. There was no, nothing we could do that would, uh, would take him. And I think all of us that tried to hunt him remember that deer with a great deal of affection because, you know, in this business, Killing the deer is, is not even the most important part of it. It is an essential part of the hunt, but uh, we exercised our best skills, and he exercised his, and he won. Running to and fro across the land It's the glorious sound of freedom I hear The prairies and mountains are haunts of this band I'm hunting the white-tailed deer 
They're wily, they're cagey, and darned hard to bag. They're a challenge to me every year. And they keep me on my toes, and the Lord only knows they're the greatest. They're the white-tailed deer. Running to and fro across the land, it's the glorious sound of freedom I hear. The prairies and mountains are haunts of this band. I'm hunting the white-tailed deer. And they keep me on my toes, and the Lord only knows they're the greatest. They're the white-tailed deer.